nothing of giving my grandson um, a crash course in technology. Um, he knew where the Wi-Fi was, he knew how to turn it on, he knew how to use an iPad, um, and in parallel with that, he's 11 now with it, and he's computer programming. Um, and it's now difficult for me to kind of re-educate him, and rewire his brain into believing that the things that I taught him um, were useful um, now pose a danger to him. But that's not where my story began, um, and what changed my mind. Um, I wrote a paper um, in 2015 for the Teaching Council of Ireland. It was on the use of technology in the classroom, and it was contemporaneous with the PISA report that Ole mentioned. And the, that report concluded that technology, the iPads that kids are being um, required in many schools to use in the classroom now, had absolutely no effect in learning. As a matter of fact, it had a negative effect in certain circumstances. And the reason I wrote that paper initially was because I was seeing the same thing in my own students, and I couldn't figure out what was happening to them. And in speaking to colleagues at various conferences globally, including a lot of Swedish colleagues, I was hearing the same thing. Something was happening with students. Um, they were becoming distracted, unable to, to, to focus, uh, and so on and so forth, on their studies. You still had the bright students, the 15% or uh, maybe 20% or more, who were focused, who could stay on task, uh, whose results were consistently good, but there were an increasing number of students um, who were failing to meet the grade, and unfortunately, uh, the universities were responding by dumping down course material. So, I banned all devices from the classroom. That was step number one. Step number, step number two was writing that paper. And when, in another forum, um, in, in I do my day job, do research in financial services and artificial intelligence, when I showed the paper to someone who's now the chief risk officer of an insurance company, he, he said to me something weird. Well, I thought it weird at the time. He said, Tom, the real danger to children in the classroom is not the technology, it's the Wi-Fi signals that the technology emits. So here was I imagining this guy, um, highly successful um, chief risk officer of an internationally renowned firm, in a tinfoil hat, because as an engineer, of course, I was well aware of the thermal effects, but absolutely unaware of non-thermal effects. And I began to study it. Um, and it took me three years, nearly three and a half years, before I'd say anything to anybody. Because what, we was, what I was seeing was so... Uh, it, 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 go, it went against the grain. And most people wouldn't have believed it. And it was only until I had become comfortable enough with the science that I began to speak about it. And, and that's where uh, the whole thing began for me when I began to write about it, um, what I had learned about a year ago. And so my, my reluctance to speak about it is because of this sort of thing. Okay? The old Russian saying, and it, 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 it relates to the two Russian newspapers, Pravda and Zvestia, uh, Truth and the News. And in Soviet Russia, there was no news in the truth. And, sorry, no truth in the news and no news in the truth. But however, there's certainly no truth in these, these collection of articles. And we have two prize-winning journalists here. One, a guy, a guy called William J. Broad, he writes for the New York Times. The first article there on, on the, the left-hand side, um, the 5G health hazard that isn't, um, appeared in the Irish Times as, are there any real links between wireless technology and health? And at the moment, I have a complaint into the Irish Press Council um, and I'm in conciliation with the Irish Times, and if I don't like the outcome, the press ombudsman will be taking um, a case against the Irish Times, um, effectively. 
and it's because what William J. Broad said was not only untrue, it distorted the facts, he didn't look at the scientific evidence, and he was um, portraying his own commentary as fact. And the gist of the article, in any case, was, was a character assassination of an American professor who was instrumental in having the state of Oregon, which is about the same size as Ireland, uh, to, um, just in June of this year, uh, take the first step to taking Wi-Fi in all of schools. Um, because it now mandates that school boards uh, look at their independent scientific research and listen to their students as to what their preferences are in terms of technology in the classroom. The second paper here comes from an Irish um, physicist. He got his PhD in physics from DCU, I believe. However, you wouldn't, by, when you read, don't fall prey to scare around ring about 5G, and he does reference physics, you'd say, how did he get a PhD in physics when he doesn't understand some of the fundamental things or concepts um, uh, in, that, in that discipline? Um, and so there's a, another group of scientists currently uh, drafted a letter um, to the Scientific American. This was an opinion piece. It was an opinion piece that was a hatchet job on Dr. Joel Moskowitz, effectively. And so again, you have two prize-winning uh, journalists come science writers who are, put another way, in a Russian, Russian phrase, useful idiots for the industry. And it's for that reason I'd like just to spend a moment or two on basic physics. So radiation is energy transmitted by particles or electromagnetic waves. And just, just to explain how you know, Dr. David Grimes, David Robert Grimes, the Irish Times uh, journalist and <coughs> physicist, he focuses on the left-hand side here. Here you have photons from radiation emitting devices, substances, whatever. And what they do is, if, there are, if they are of sufficient energy... Now, when we go out into natural light, natural sunlight, uh, the photons from that sunlight uh, impact on our bodies and our eyes, and that's how we see, okay? <coughs> but they're of low energy. They're non-ionizing. Which photons that have sufficient fre high frequency and energy, what they have the power to do effectively is, is displace an electron from an individual atom. Okay? That's, that's in, well, under certain circumstances, you know, the body can respond from that if you think of these, these photons hitting the body from a, um, an ionizing source, such as, for example, X-rays. We can sustain a certain amount of X-rays in our life and not incur the risk of, of uh, developing cancer as a result. Um, so just parking that one there, on the other side, you'll see an electromagnetic wave. And that carries its energy as the name suggests, both electrically and magnetically. And typically, non-ionizing radiation, some of which photons are important, but the vast majority of which, and we're talking about wireless technologies here now, it's electromagnetic waves that are the problem for us. Just, ooh, that didn't turn out too well, because you can see the red stuff on the ionizing side. Yeah. Um, and the nano -ionism. And you can see here the nuclear radiation, gamma X-rays, X-rays, and half of the, well, roughly the upper part of the ultraviolet spectrum, for which we wear sunscreen, um, um, is ionizing. And from the bottom half, in the, the bottom half of UV, and the visible light, and inf infrared radiation, and microwave, and radio, all fall into the non-ionizing category. As we go up here, the frequency goes up, okay? And so does the amount of energy, all things being equal. <coughs> However, when it comes to thermal and non-thermal effects, what, what I call the dominant paradigm 
the dominant industry paradigm which, for which engineers are responsible. They believe that non-ionizing radiation, microwave and radio, has only thermal effects and no non-thermal effects. And I'll explain that in a second. And I'm, 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 I'm not a physicist, I'm not a biologist, I'm not a chemist, I, I'm not a distinguished um, oncologist, a medical doctor, a medical scientist. And this is my interpretation, so please bear with me. Um, so our bodies are electrochemical in function. And we evolved, as Ole um, uh, pointed out, in an environment with a very low background level of non-ionizing radiation as well as ionizing radiation. So we evolved in that, you know, for hundreds of thousands of years. And it's only in the last hundred years or so that we've increasingly ramped up our exposure to world's radiation, whether it was initially from radio, <coughs> then TV, uh, and then industrial sources like radar, microwave communications, and in the last 20 years or so, wireless on a grand scale. You know, people don't realize, if you, if you look, for example, at the maps of 1G and 2G and 3G and 4G antenna in the United States, they grew explain, exponentially. And with 5G, you know, they're going to grow even more. Um, so what that means, in effect, is we're all bathed in this some, what some people are calling electrosmog. But what it is, is non-ionizing radio frequency radiation of various frequencies. And as Ole indicated, very, very low signal strengths and, intended, uh, and intensities have biological effects. Because when you think about it, if you think, think of the central nervous system, for example, which is perhaps most affected in terms of some of the, the headline uh, diseases and um, medical conditions that are now appearing. Um, neurons, the, 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 the essential cells here, communicate using electricity. And at either end you have uh, chemical reactions. And, and, and these signal strengths are, are extremely low. So if you get, for example, um, neurological problems, you get, you go to hospital, and you get an EEG, and it measure your brain electricity and activity. And the same, if you have a heart condition, you're going to get an ECG. Um, so th the first line of defense here is to look at, at the electrical signals in your body. Now, the electromagnetic waves that we take for granted from all sources do have an impact at a cellular level, and it's at a cellular level that things begin to happen because they trigger um, a cascade of reactions and the mechanisms have been identified okay, in many hundreds of papers, if not thousands. So they do exist and have been proven uh, both in, at in vitro, which means uh, on animal and human cells, and also in vivo, which means experiments on, uh, on rats and mice uh, and other animals, and also in human beings. Now, Ole has touched on this, and he was using SAR. Um, I, I'm focused, and he mentioned the figure of 9 million microwatts per meter square. What the FCC, that's the Federal Communications Commission, and the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection, ERCNIP, um, have decided on is, uh, is a level of 10 watts per meter squared for 30 minutes of exposure. That's extremely high. It's, it's also 61 volts per, per, per meter. And as we see, um, the safe levels here, the European Academy for Environmental Med Medicine, European, um, has, after the Bioinitiative Report, um, uh, decided that um, 10 microwatts per meter squared daytime exposure for an adult um, is safe. Okay, now that, that could change depend, depending on the science. <coughs> but that's, 
that's a million times less than the safe level of exposure the Irish government is, is proposing as its standard, when in, in actual fact it's only a guideline, and only a technical guideline at, at that. The European also specified one microwatt per meter squared at night time, and 0 0.1 microwatt per meter squared for sensitive people. Um, functionally impaired people, maybe. Uh, children, for example. And, and that's 100 million times less than what uh, the Irish government is proposing as being safe for you and your children and your grandchildren. Now, apologies, you probably can't see, the, see this in the back of the room, but I mentioned a while ago about the, the, chain, of event, the chain of mechanisms uh, that are, have been identified in the, in the scientific literature as being um, responsible for the outcomes here. And like Ole um, um, pointed out, general health impacts are lower sperm count and sperm quality, immune dysfunction, cardiovascular effects, miscarriage, asthma, blood brain barrier problems, with cancers, gliomas, acoustic neuromas, and salivary gland tumors, and neuropsychiatric effects like Alzheimer's disease, cognitive processing effects, or the brain development, sleep disturbance, insomnia, and so on. So if you look at the, the right-hand side here, um, what, what scientists argue is that very, very low intensity signals um, cause what is a, a, a natural reaction within cells, but it's an overreaction in this case, in that it triggers something called voltage-gated calcium channels, which results in an influx of calcium ions into the cell. Um, and that's a natural process, but it's unnatural if it's been triggered all of the time. Um, and it's, it, it's problematic because it does two things. Number one is that the chemical reaction creates something called reactive oxygen uh, species, or you might have come across them as free radicals. And, and these are molecules that are looking for bo to bond with something. And the body's natural response to that um, is through antioxidants, which neutralize them before they can do any harm, like, for example, breaking uh, DNA strands, um, which, for which the end result is cancer, or could be from a probabilistic. I mean, with every exposure, my background to this comes from a risk perspective, with every, every exposure we have to um, a, a, an environment pollutant or a toxin increases the likelihood Okay? but not necessarily the certainty that we're going to get um, a life-threatening disease like cancer. But when it starts from a very young age, and when it's 24-7, um, it's only a matter of time before um, you see something bad happening. And the other effect here is that not only does, it, does radio frequency radiation increase free radicals, but it also, through two mechanisms, has the effect of it decreasing antioxidants. So, a decrease in one and an increase in the other means an imbalance. Now, to be sure, if the body is given time to heal itself, self-healing, right? If it's, if it's removed from this environment, which is, has many toxins in it, environmental toxins, it can repair itself. But that's not what's happening today. It's not possible to do today. Mm -hmm. I'd like to go back to this particular study. Um, I, 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 I'm writing a paper at the moment on, on the history of this, and it's very revealing. Um, because uh, as one study published for uh, NASA and the, Euro the US Energy Agency in 1980 identified, right? And at the time, and I was studying satellite engineering at the time, and I remember, I remember it well, um, what the Yanks were proposing to do was put satellites into space with huge solar arrays to capture energy from the sun and beam it back down to Earth as microwave beams. 
And of course, we're interested in identifying, well, what would the biological effects be of, of that? And um, the scientists involved identified that there were two different philosophical paradigms here, or models. One was from Eastern Europe, from Soviet Russia, and the other one was a dominant paradigm in the US. And the US Naval, Naval Medical Research Unit, which began its research after a symposium, I think, in 1969, and it completed its bibliography in 1976, and it catalogued 3,700 studies at that point in time that identified thermal effects, which you see here, included heating of the whole body, brain, eyes, testicles, and sinuses, and non-thermal effects, including oxidative process change, decreased fertility, altered fetal development, muscle contraction, cardiovascular changes, altered menstrual activity, liver enlargement, and changes in condition, reflexes, and so on. So back in 76, the facts were known. So what happened after that? Well, unfortunately, not a whole lot. Um, the US EPA, Environment Protection Agency, studied this from 75 to 95, before that even it was defunded by Bill Clinton. <laughs> And at the same time, he signed the uh, U.S. Telecommunications Act, which makes it impossible for anybody in the U.S. now to challenge the erection and deployment of antennae carrying any radio frequency signal. So you, you just have to suck it up in the States, and that's the way it is since 1995. Um, in 1995 also, because the industry was aware of the, the, the risks that the technology it was rolling out as 2G at that point in time presented. It had Dr. George Carroll, who it identified as a friendly scientist, um, to, to head up the World's Technology Research Program with 28.5 million funding. Of course, when that five-year study ended, or whatever, I think it was just about five years, and when Dr. Carroll reported back to the industry, the news wasn't good and he wasn't about to bury it, so they fired him. And then he wrote his book, um, Cell Phones, Invisible Hazards in the Wireless Age, an Insider's Alarming Discoveries about Cancer and Genetic Damage. At the same time, a Motorola engineer, also an in insider, um, R.C. Kane, published Cellular Telephone Russian Roulette, and again he was telling the same story. And there have been many hundreds, if not thousands of studies in, in that period, but also of note is the Bioinitiative Report, uh, which is published in 2007, updated in 2012, and new updates in 2019, and it currently holds 2,026 peer-reviewed studies on RFR effects, specifically. So that's a lot of research, and all of these are scientific papers published in peer-reviewed journals, leading journals, that the likes of William J. Broad and, and David Robert Grimes should know about and should have read. And so too should the Irish government mm -hmm. and their advisors in the Department of Communications. And by the way, that Dutch study that was referenced earlier doesn't reference any of them. So between 2007 and 2014 again, and all this work comes from Henry Lai, by the way, uh, <coughs> Professor Lai, who uh, Ole referenced from the University of Washington. And um, of 114 papers published on genetic effects, 65 reported effects, in other words, clear evidence. Neurological effects, 68. Oxidative status, which leads to all of the above, 88. But when you update that to 2019, you'll see that the amount of studies, or the percentage of studies, <coughs> reporting positive effects, in other words, you know, the link between radio frequency radiation and neurological effects and, um, and cancers has increased. Absolutely. <coughs> um, well, I mentioned the International Agency for Research in Cancer and its classification as um, radio frequency radiation is a class could be carcinogen. But since then, there's been, as you can imagine, exposure to radio frequency radiation and various types of cancers.
However, the smoking gun, without a doubt, comes from the US. And this is a study you probably never heard about because it hasn't been really reported in the press. Its initial, its, its initial findings were published in 2016. And then for two years, it went under, under extensive peer review. And the peer review was carried out by independent scientists who said, who told the National Toxicology Program and the US Department of Health that they were downplaying the effects. They were understating it. There is a new book out at the moment, published by three scientists, and it's something that kind of, you know, got me thinking a long time ago about climate change and about how conservative climate change scientists were in publishing their results. And it's a psychological study of how they made decisions. And I, I, I always thought they were just being conservative and cautious, but in actual fact there's a bit of group think going on. And we would not now be in the mess we are in with climate change had these scientists been braver, stood up, and told it as it was. But instead, they, they, they watered down um, the message to be more receptive to policy makers instead of telling the truth. So what the US Department of Health's National Toxicology Program says and this is quoted, um, I'm quoting um, Hardell and Carberg here, who reviewed it independently. And what they said in 2019 is, there is clear evidence, by the way, clear evidence is, is the highest standard of scientific proof. There is clear evidence that RF radiation is a human carcinogen, causing glioma and vestibular schwannomas, acoustic neuromas. There is some evidence of an increased risk of developing thyroid cancer, and clear evidence that RF radiation is a multi-site carcinogen. The Ramazzini Institute, um, the NTP study, the first one there, right, focused on near field, 2 and 3G radiation. The Ramazzini Institute looked at far field, that is, uh, radiation of very, very low intensities from masts and antennae. And they've effectively replicated the findings of the near field NTP study. And so, you know, there is, for any reasonable person, um, conclusive proof in those. If you didn't need it already from the many thousands of studies that had been published previously. However, in March of this year, an advisory group of 29 scientists that's an advisory group now to the WHO. These guys aren't, um, you know, these guys, they, they, they were convened for this purpose. Uh, from 18 countries recommended that non-ionizing radio frequency radiation be prioritized by the WHO's IARC in their next round of monographs. So what that means is the IRC are going to meet um, from 2020 to 2024 and review all of the, the carcinogens that are at maybe 2B and 2A, to determine if they warranted uh, elevation to a class 1 status. And given that most, um, most scientists, based on this data, now believe that it should be a class 1 carcinogen, it's only a matter of time before that happens. And a lot of school principals and policy makers globally will be looking back ruefully at the decisions they made, despite the best advice they were getting from independent scientists, such as Ole. One of the claims made in the Irish Times, the New York Times, and Scientific American, and it's, it's interesting to note that William J. Broad, in the New York Times, was citing um, our own uh, Dr. David Robert Grimes uh, as saying there was no uptick in cancer. I'm only producing the latest studies here, right? Um, so, Astro Medal, and they looked at um, the increase in the incidence of certain cancers of the central nervous system, non-Hodgkin lymphomas, um, renal, hepatic, thyroid tumors, increased among American adolescents, 
Lancet Neurology study reports, that's a separate study just this year, that cancer of the central nervous system is responsible for substantial morbidity and mortality worldwide. And the incidence has increased between 1990 and 1916. You have to find then you know, what caused the increase. Of course, there are lots of environmental toxins out there. But as we'll see in a minute, um, the, the major suspect is undoubtedly radiofrequency radiation. Um, and evidence of that is, there's, there are studies reporting um, evidence that radiofrequency radiation is responsible for causing increase in breast cancer in females. And there's, you know, when you look at some of the case studies there, um, it's directly, these cancers are, are arising in areas directly beneath where these women have been carrying their mobile phones in their brands, either through exercise or whatever. But it's, it's even worse than that. Because in 2019, again, just this year, the Journal of Cancer described a rising incidence of colorectal cancer among young Americans, adolescents, and um, males and females in their 20s and 30s. Uh, another study um, found that, again, colorectal cancer in people under 50 in Denmark, New Zealand, and UK since 2019. And yet another European study uh, produced similar results. And this led um, one uh, scientist, um, Dr. De Kun Lee, um, and I'll bring him up next, um, and his team at Kaiser Permanente to comment that um, if you look at how young people today carry their phones, they carry them in the back pockets of their jeans and in the front pockets. Now, carrying them around for males in the front pockets is a bad idea, given what we know about um, the effect of radio frequency radiation on, on the test days. Um, but now it appears that colorectal cancer is in the frame also. Remember that, and I, I, I neglected to mention it, not only is radio frequency radiation a carcinogen, it is also a co-carcinogen. In other words, uh, studies have been done on mice and rats, which have showed, and these, these have been engineered to be susceptible to cancer, okay? Um, so the normal way a study like that goes is you have a control group and you have an experimental group, okay? And the experimental group gets an additional dose, both get fed maybe a carcinogen, uh, and there, both sets of mice or rats would be predisposed to developing cancer. And in the experimental group, they add the, the, the target thing, the one to experiment uh, with. And in this case, it's microwave radio frequency radiation. And guess what? Um, the rats exposed to radio frequency radiation end up with um, a higher incidence of cancer, uh, perhaps even more aggressive, and they don't live as long, and so on and so on. So, you know. It being a co-carcinogen is, is well recognized in the literature. <clears throat> this one is a very interesting study for me. Um, it, it kind of, it, in it, this team from Kaiser Permanente, right? Now, Kaiser Permanente have a kind of bad reputation in the United States. They're a healthcare company. Um, and what they want to do is, is limit the amount of health claims they have. So, you know, the research that they do is in order to avoid them uh, having to pay out uh, health insurance claims. So it, let's be honest about this. There was follow the money here, right? But nevertheless, they were concerned. And they were so concerned that they had 913 pregnant women who uh, were their subscribers carry um, EMF meters. And these EMF meters measured their exposure to uh, sources of EMF and radio frequency radiation. And what they found was, and they were looking for miscarriage risk here initially, and what they found was that um, the women with the highest exposure were th roughly three times more likely to miscarry. However, oh, they went a step further. The children who were born to women that carry full term were also studied in follow-up studies. 
And what they found was that prenatal in utero exposure um, was linked with, is correlational, not causational here, right? Um, but nevertheless, uh, it's strong pause for thought in that asthma cases were 2.7 times uh, greater to children born to women with high exposures, as were obesity five times, and ADHD nearly three times. Now Ole presented a study earlier on. Uh, there was a study, a similar study done in Yale by one of America's premier obstetrician gynecologists, Hugh Taylor. And Professor Taylor and his team studied um, rats, pregnant rats. And again, control group, no exposure, the experimental group, exposure to normal levels, right, of, of radio frequency radiation from a 3G mobile phone. And the rats are pregnant, by the way. Um, and he did follow-up studies of the pups into adulthood, which isn't a long time in, 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 rat, in rat years, shall we say. Um, and what he found, and there's been lots of studies in rats, they're the more, most experimented on and, uh, and well understood, particularly in terms of their learning. So what he discovered was that the, 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 the rats born to the exposed mothers, uh, or the rats that were exposed in utero, um, had learning problems. Uh, they're also hyperactive for rodents. Uh, in other words, they exhibited similar um, conditions to human subjects, human children, that, that were studied in the Kaiser Permanente study. But in this case, it wasn't correlational. Causation was attributed because it was an experiment. So if we are to generalize from that, that study into human beings, exposure to radio frequency radiation in the womb uh, for uh, our children ain't a good idea. Because when they sacrifice those rats, in other words, when those rats were, were killed at a, at a, at a, when they reached adulthood, and their brains examined, they found abnormal neurological development, which explained what they were saying in behavioral terms. There are two papers, there, there are probably more, but one, one is a paper uh, published on uh, the mortality rates for Alzheimer's in Sweden, and it's much worse than that one. The, these, um, these figures are, um, um, are averaged, uh, age averaged, whereas, but nevertheless, 40 of, of, um, of, of, um, of examination. Down here, right, in Ireland, in 1997, and this is when, apparently, when things were first recorded, the, um, the mortality among females was around 15 per 100,000 for Alzheimer's disease, and males, it was about 22. By 2013, that had increased to about 40 to 60 per 100,000. Okay? So that's about three times, three times increase. If we look in Sweden, in 1994, it's about five deaths per 100,000. And if you go back down to the period to, to, uh, 2013, it's gone up from um, about 50 for females and 65 for males. We look at Finland, which maps onto uh, the, the details we just studied, that's separate from this. We start off down here around just 35 per 100,000, uh, and it goes up. And males and females aren't too far apart here. 270 to 300. I jokingly call the effect, because the, the, the other graph, which unfortunately I didn't include, has a hockey stick effect, right? After 2013, it kind of goes up. Um, and I call it the ABBA effect, because around the time that ABBA kind of broke up, <laughs> Alzheimer's starts to take off big time. <laughs> There's no relationship, but maybe if you're listening to their music, I don't know. 
So I want to talk. I want to just wanted to think about the risk here, right? If we look at the other cast who are big carcinogens, I was um, asked by uh, some parents in Scotland um, to um, help them make a case against Wi-Fi in the classroom. So when I, I, I gave them a, a, an earlier version of my paper, uh, there was pushback from the IT director of the municipality that was responsible for, for, for the primary schools in the area. And he said, class 2B carcinogens, that's the same as pickled vegetables. Um, and, and obviously it was to fob off. But if you look at the research on cancer from pickled vegetables, we don't eat a lot of them in Ireland. But they do in Japan and China and um, Korea, South Korea. And research on Japanese people and, and, so, and, and South Koreans is unequivocal. If you eat this stuff on a regular basis, you're 50% more likely to cancer of colon. So, so, but you can avoid all these other toxins and carcinogens. You can avoid cigarette smoke. You can not smoke all, altogether. You can take yourself out of um, environments where they are known to be toxic. Okay. You eat organic vegetables in order to avoid ingesting pesticides and herbicides. Okay. You eat non-GMO uh, food to you know avoid um, any genetically modified organisms. So you, you can avoid all that. But as I mentioned earlier. Radio frequency radiation acts at a cellular level at extremely low power levels. And RFR's impact is now global. We carry devices around in our pockets. Young people today, and these devices, right, your smartphone, has a 2G unit, has a 3G unit, has a 4G unit. It has a Bluetooth unit. It has a Wi-Fi unit. And I bet, you know, if, I bet you if you do carry one around, or if your children carry them around in their pockets or whatever, or on their persons, typically you'll have, they'll be using WhatsApp or Instagram, so the Wi-Fi is on. So if you look at a small print in Wi-Fi, what's the safe level? What's the safe distance from the human body? Eight inches, 20 centimeters is the safe operating distance. For thermal effects. Thermal effects. So just about everybody, including kids in classrooms, and teachers give them iPads, just about everybody is breaking the safety standards. You're in breach of them, which means whatever hope of getting, you know, and, and that's what, what's going to happen when folks rock up to these um, the, these manufacturers with class actions and you know you'll be asked, well, where did you carry your phone? Oh, my back pocket, my front pocket, I'm sorry. Yeah. Was Wi-Fi on? Yeah. Well, eight inches, 20 centimeters. And even on the telephony side, an inch. And that's assuming, right, that these phones are actually, um, have been manufactured to emit within the FCC and the guidelines. 2015 in France, phone gate. The French regulator, miraculously how, what, what prompted them to do it, I don't know, but they tested all of the smartphones in the market and found nine or a ten of them were transmitting at levels higher than the guidelines. There's a class action ongoing in the States at the moment. The Chicago Tribune um, studied the latest iPhone and Samsung phones. Uh, and used an, independ in, an independent lab to do so, and it found that they were breaching FCC guidelines. The industry has been allowed to self-regulate. And when that happens, as we all know from the financial industry, closer to home with me, you know what the predictable um, outcomes are. So, we have no safe space. There is no safe harbor. We have 24 hour exposure to this stuff. And you know, most people, 99.9% .9 people, do not know the facts. I, I meet them on a daily basis. They're surprised when they hear I'm kind of 
talking about this and writing about this and speaking about this. Um, they're in disbelief because they haven't been informed, even though Ireland is a signatory to uh, the um, European Assembly's uh, Council of Europe Resolution 1815. It has not informed the Irish public of the risks and continues not to inform the Irish public, uh, public uh, of the risks. And so, what can we do? Well, well I put in this one. Uh, it's a bit like our kids are right, right? So, this is the usual stuff we see. That's criminal, yeah. or should be criminal. That's appalling, because that's what you normally see. The radio units here on that laptop, right? The iPad could be here or here, right by her, her tummy. And this guy pulling the phone here. Likewise, this is what you see normally outside secondary schools, or even primary schools now. And this is abuse. You get out in the classroom. If and the people guilty in Ireland, right, uh, without a doubt, are the Department of Communications, okay, the Minister for Children, mm -hmm. and the Minister for Health. Yes. I've written to the three of them. Um, the Department of Health kicked it over to the Department of Communications, who pointed me in the direction of the usual studies, um, which are outdated, defunct, and don't take into account the <coughs> significant body of scientific evidence. And just to finish, and I said I would finish um, within the half hour, and I think I've gone well over that, but not too much. In the absence of knowledge, we need to educate, educate our children, uh, and spread the word out there. And that's the reason why you're here today. And you, have to, you just have to talk to people, just to make them aware of the dangers. And the only way they get to believe you, I think, um, because again, you have that tinfoil hat moment that I had four years ago with the chief risk officer of this insurance company, is that you won't be believed. Mm -hmm. it, it, my, my grandson, he's 11, he said, Granddad, you're going to spoil it for us? <laughs> um, I'm not, I said, I'm trying to protect you. Um, but, you know, that, that's in an 11 year old, there'd be this huge pushback. But the young people have, I suppose, they're driving the climate agenda at the moment and climate action. Um, it'll come as some shock to them that, you know, their sort of ultimate survival is, is something that comes much closer to home. It's in their pockets. Thank you very much.